We'll be continuing, inshallah, from where we left off. Um, I do have some notes, uh, brief notes for you, um, which uh, will be handed out shortly once they are printed. We started discussing the biography, life of uh, a great Sufi poet, someone who's highly uh, regarded, not just in terms of his poetry, but also his, uh, his knowledge and his, uh, his rank amongst the Sufiya, um, in particular in the Chishti Silsila, the Chishti Sufi order, Khaja Amir Khusro, uh, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And you know, we started off last time, I, I gave you a brief uh, overview of what Tasawwuf actually is. And in fact, uh, perhaps it was more what Tasawwuf isn't uh, than what it actually is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُهُلَنَا That those who seek uh, a path towards us, those who strive and struggle towards us, then we shall certainly guide them towards a path. And we will guide them towards our path. And so this is effectively what the Sawf actually is. With regards to a definition, it's so difficult to actually give you one definition that some of the ulama um, have mentioned that there are more than 2,000 definitions of what the Sawf actually is. And the reason for that is because the Sawf, it, it's such a wide uh, topic, it's such a vast ocean that everyone who's uh, dived into this ocean, they've come back up with their own pearls. Whatever they've taken from it, whatever they've understood from it, however they've benefited from it, they have uh, formulated a, uh, a view that this is what the Sawf actually is. And so you have these so many different views about what the Sawf actually is. And in reality, um, the simplest definition is that this is a path that the seeker treads in order to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a means of purifying the soul and purifying the heart. And this is one of the reasons, and there's, if you look at it linguistically, it has various different origins. One of the origins of the Sawf, or why do we call the people who, who, who practice this, uh, this science, who learn about it, why do we call them Sufiya? One of the reasons is because uh, this word Tasawuf, it comes from the Arabic word Tasfiya, which means uh, to, to purify and to cleanse. And um, another term that's used, and, and that's obvious because one of the the four responsibilities of prophethood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, highlights within the Quran that the Prophet was sent with, one of them is to purify his people. And so this tazkiya or tasfiya is uh, why, because those people they practice this, this, uh, uh, this practice of cleansing their inner selves, they become known as Sufiya. Um, another origin for this particular word is uh, suf, which is a type of cloth. And they started to wear this, this cloth, which was considered a mark of humility. And so we see that tasawwuf is all about humility. Some ulama say that the, this word tasawwuf, it comes from a connection with Ahlul Sufa, uh, those Sahaba who dedicated everything you know, to learning about the deen and uh, accompanying the Prophet وسلم, as much as possible, stayed in the masjid. They were considered to be guests of the Prophet وسلم. when he ate, they ate, 
and, and so on, and they learned whatever they could from the Prophet And so that's why those people who adopted these uh, characteristics, they became known as Sufiya. Some ulama say that this comes from the word Safwa, and Safwa means characteristics, adorning yourself and with characteristics. And so, because these people, they adorn themselves with such characteristics that make them beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they become known as Sufiya. So that, that's just a, a glimpse at, you know, this wide spectrum, this huge spectrum as to where these words come from and why. This term was actually introduced um, more towards the second century in the Hijri calendar. So the second century. And so there, immediately, some, uh, some voices, you'll start hearing some voices immediately. And those voices can be satisfied very, very simply by saying that when we say that this is... Because remember, last time when you came in, the, I think one of the first things I said to you was that if you think that this is all about, you know, it's all a song and dance and it's about, uh, you know, uh, uh, growing your hair very long and wearing uh, necklaces of, uh, of beads uh, around your neck, and uh, um, this is not the Sawuf. You've, you've come to the wrong place. Right? The Sawuf is it's about polishing that mirror that you have in your chest, in your heart, and being able to peer into it. And then, you know, attracting, trying to attract the... The jandiyat, the, the blessings uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that mirror or that looking glass and then seeing uh, what you can see. And so that essentially is what the sawuf is. And those who are able to perfect that, they, are, they become uh, known as the Sufiya. Why did the Sahaba not need it? The simple reason is, uh, the, there's a hadith uh, regarding the Sahaba, uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, and the other Sahabi, um, the, the name eludes me, uh, Alama Sahib here, maybe if uh, uh, he might be able to remind me, but um, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, a very famous uh, sound tradition, he bumps into another Sahabi and he says, uh, uh, how are you doing? And he says, I've, uh, I've become a munafiq. And uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, he's very surprised, he says, how's, how's that, how have you become a munafiq? He says, when we're sat in front of the Prophet sallallahu when we are in his gathering and he tells us about the deen, it is as if we are observing Jannah and Jahan Jahannam first hand. It's like we're looking at it. And then when we walk away, some of those barakah and those blessings, they go away and we, we forget certain things. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, what was his response? He said, if that's the case, then I've become a munafiq as well. I've become a hypocrite as well. Because I don't experience those things uh, when I'm not in the company of the Prophet ﷺ that I do when I'm there. But the fact is that the company of the Prophet ﷺ, one gaze of benevolence from the Prophet ﷺ, uh, did for those people, the Sahaba, more than thousands of hours of gathering and concentrating and focusing and working on our nafs that we could ever <coughs> hope to achieve from thousands of hours one gaze of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did that and more for those who were in his company, and that's why they didn't need it. There was no need for that. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in his company, trained the Sahaba in such a way that their hearts were absolutely uh, polished and shimmering, and they were then able to guide others. And this is perhaps why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the fire will not touch any Muslim who has seen me or a Muslim who has seen another Muslim that has seen me. So in other words, the Sahaba and the Tabi'een. And it is after, when you go beyond that time of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, when this need arises, remember, if the Sahaba were saying that they left the gathering of the Prophet wasallam and they didn't experience such blessings uh, as they did when they were in the Majlis, then what about those who are now 100 years away from the Prophet wasallam? Right? So this is why that need then arose. It's not that the Sahaba were not Sufiya. You will not find any greater Sufiya than the Sahaba. It's the fact that this terminology and this, uh, this knowledge, this practice was not common amongst them or it was not known by this name amongst the Sahaba. This, become, this became introduced to them later on. And so this is, these are the kind of people that we're talking about, those people who've been able to, to uh, polish that, that mirror or that looking glass and they've been able to then peer into it and actually connect with themselves in order to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we finished last time on a point about 
Khaja Amir Khusro, Rahmanullah Ta'ala. And um, <coughs> he, about his, his links with, uh, with the kings, with the royalty in uh, the subcontinent. And I, I think I mentioned to you that uh, there was, uh, in his lifetime, he was in the court of seven different kings. They, they died, they came to the throne, they died, and then the next one, and so on. And every single one of them wished to have Khaja Amir Khusro besides him. And one thing which I think we missed last time, which should have been the very first thing that we discussed, was uh, I did mention to you that Amir Khusro, Amir was a title that was given to him by the king, where he was, made, where he was given a senior rank in the army of the king, and he became known as Amir. So his father was also known as Amir as well, and that goes with his name, Amir Saifuddin Mahmud. That was his father. So his father's name was Saifuddin Mahmud Shamsi. Um, but uh, Khaja Amir Khusro, Rahimallah Ta'ala, I think we missed his actual name, his birth name. Now his kunniya, the name that he was known by, was Abul Hassan. His actual name was Yaminuddin. So the name that he was given at birth was Yaminuddin. The blessing and barakah of the deen, of the religion. That was his name. And uh, he then later acquired these titles of Amir from the king and also Khusro as well uh, in terms of his poetry and his uh, poetic contributions. So the last thing that we, we left on last time was uh, Khaja uh, mahbub -e ilahi Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya, Rahimallah Ta'ala, and how the king wished to visit Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya, and Khaja Amir Khusro, Rahimallah Ta'ala, he went and he told his sheikh, he said that the king's going to come in disguise, and he wants to see where, how you're able to fund this huge uh, operation that you've got going, how you're able to feed so many people, and how, how you're able to look after so many people. And so I mentioned this last time as well, and I will reiterate that this has been the practice of the Sufiya from day one, is been looking after people and looking after them physically as well, nourishing them with physical food as well as uh, nurturing their souls and polishing uh, their hearts. And so uh, Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya, Rahimallah Ta'ala, he said to him, he said, this is not going to happen. I have two entrances here. When royalty enters through one entrance, I will leave through the other entrance. And so uh, he then said to him, you've told me, but what will become of you? And this is precisely what we finished on. He said to his sheikh, he said, if I had betrayed you and not told you, this would have been the death of my soul. What's the worst that the king can do if he finds out that I'm the one who told you? What's the worst that he can do? He will kill me and that will be the death of my body. And that will be me moving on to a different realm and a different world. But if I had betrayed you, this would have been the, the death of my soul. And so, he, during his lifetime, if you remember, even in uh, early age, around the age of 18, when he, was when he first went into the court of the king, that was when his first major work, uh, poetic work, was published. If you remember from last time, his first poem in the Persian language he wrote at the age of, anyone remember? Eight. Coincidentally, at the age of eight. Right? So he was remarkably talented, he was a natural talent in poetry. So he, one of his most amazing works is something entitled No Asman. And it's a poetic encyclopedia about India in which he talks about the land, he talks about the agriculture, he talks about the scenery, he talks about <coughs> you know, the, the trees and vegetation, he talks about the animals and he, this was requested from him by one of the kings and the king said to him, look, you've, in your time you've, uh, you've been in the company of several kings. You've traveled throughout the subcontinent and you have a vast amount of knowledge. I want you to bring this knowledge to the public through your pen. And so he authored this encyclopedia in the form of poetry, which is absolutely remarkable. Um, if you, 
you know, if, if we had the opportunity, we'd, we'd look at that briefly, but um, unfortunately we don't. But that's one of his, uh, one of his quite amazing works. And the, the king, who, uh, the last one that he accompanied was uh, Ghiasuddin Tughlaq. He was the last king that he was with. And uh, he, you know, a question might arise, well, what kind of a Sufi was he if he was always lavishing in the co uh, royal courts? Perhaps some of you might have been thinking that as well. The fact is, he did try to uh, free himself of that obligation of that commitment many times and he wasn't permitted to and he even sought advice on this matter from his sheikh Khaja Nizamuddin Aliya rahimahullah ta'ala and his sheikh he said to him as well he said your your tasawwuf your practices of cleansing your inner self that's your own personal and private matter deal with the dunya as well do your job and deal with the dunya as well and uh, and, and, and accompany them. And so perhaps one of the reasons was that the company of such a noble, humble uh, individual would actually uh, have some uh, uh, effect on these kings and on the royalty as well. And so he wasn't able to. Even at the command of his sheikh, uh, he was <coughs> then told and commanded to, to maintain a presence with the royalty. One of his very remarkable achievements is that he's known as the father of the Urdu language. And there's different stories as to how this came about. The gist of all of them is exactly the same. That uh, certain people, whether it was the king uh, or whether it was other people, certain people came to him and they said, look, we're living in a land which is very rich and diverse. We have a Persian influence, we have a Turkish influence, um, you know, and we have an Arabic influence, we have various different influences in our culture and people speak different languages and this is a, uh, it's causing divisions and distance between the various different communities. We'd like you to, to, uh, to do something to remedy this, somehow bring these people together. And so he then laid down the foundation of what we now today know as Urdu. Those who know Urdu know that it is a mixture of various different languages, Arabic, Persian, uh, the original uh, Hindi or uh, dialects that were spoken in uh, the subcontinent at the time. It's a mixture of various different languages and this was something that was a, a, a huge service of his in terms of uh, the, the culture uh, of the subcontinent, that this was something that brought uh, this diverse culture together and it infused everything together beautifully uh, this uh, Urdu language as we now know it. Khaja Amir Khusro or Yamin din as his name is he wasn't the only one in his family to have this link with this great spiritual master Khaja mahbub -e ilahi Now our topic doesn't concern him, otherwise he himself is somebody that we could talk about um, endlessly. Um, I think the title that he's been given uh, speaks for itself. Mahbub ilahi the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, who, that's who, what he was known as. Khadr Nizamuddin was known as Mahbub ilahi And so it wasn't just him who had a connection with Khadr Mahbub ilahi Nizamuddin Awliya, rahimahullah ta'ala. In last week's uh, lecture, I told you that Khaja Nizamuddin was actually living in Khaja Amir Khusro's maternal grandfather's home. And so when his father, when uh, Kha, uh, Amir Saifuddin, Khaja Amir Khusro's father, when he relocated to Delhi with his family, at that particular time, while uh, Khaja Amir Khusro was six or eight years old at the time, Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya was living in the home of his grandfather. And so he grew up around him. <coughs> when his father saw how, uh, what an amazing person he was and how his, his father-in-law, how greatly he loved him and honored him, he himself, along with all three of his uh, children, 
uh, they took Ba'a at the hands of Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya Rahimallah Ta'ala. So his brother, his elder brother was also a very dear and beloved disciple and murid of Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya Rahimallah Ta'ala. However, when, whenever they went to visit, when they went to see Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya Rahimallah Ta'ala at his dargah, it was Amir Khusro who uh, attracted the attention of the Sheikh. And as soon as Amir Khusro came into the, the dargah, Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya Rahimallah Ta'ala, he would have him sit by his side. And he would reserve a seat for him and he would say, uh, Khusro, sit next to me, sit beside me. And in all of his gatherings where Amir Khusro was there, the commencement of that public gathering or that halakha or dhikr would begin, <coughs> the commencement would be and it would begin with the kalam, uh, with poetry written by Amir Khusro. So not only would he sit next to his, uh, would he be seated next to his sheikh, but he would also be, uh, the sheikh would ask him to commence the gathering with uh, kalam written by Amir Khusro. To the extent that Khaja Mahbub Ilahi Nizamuddin Awliya Rahimallah Ta'ala, he's narrated to have said one day, he, he was so beloved to his Sheikh, and that's, that should tell you that there was something special about him, there was something there. He was so beloved to his Sheikh that um, one day his Sheikh said to him, he said, Khusro, I sometimes get fed up of this dunya. I get fed up of everything in this dunya. To the point where I sometimes get fed up of myself. But I never ever get fed up of you. So this was his uh, 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 accommodation, if you like, from his sheikh. And this shows you how beloved he was to his sheikh, Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya, Rahimallah Ta'ala. It was, his, uh, it was his habit, Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya Mahbub Ilahi Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, it was his habit that he would, in the evening, he would retire to his own quarters. And that's when, where he would begin his private dhikr and tasbihat. No one, and that means absolutely no one, had the courage to go and disturb him while he was doing his own Adhkar and his uh, wazaif, his tasbihat. That is with the exception of Amir Khusr. So nobody else had the courage to go and speak to him and to actually see him during this time when he was in seclusion, except for uh, Khaja Amir Khusr. When he went, whenever he went during this time, the Shaykh would invite him in and he, ha he would have him sit next to him and they would talk, he would say, a, a very beautiful, just a short phrase. You know, it, it would be beautiful if we could understand it in the original language, but just a very uh, beautiful phrase in that he would just say to him, uh, Khusro, what's new? And Khusro would begin and he would start reciting some of his poetry and so on. And they would sit and, uh, and, to, and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all night. This was the status that Amir Khusro had in the court of his Sheikh Mahbub Ilahi Nizamuddin Awliya Rahmanullah Ta'ala. One day, and this is one of the reasons, you know what I said to you last time that I'll tell you the reason why I think. And in my opinion, yes, I've seen uh, people spiritually affected by different kalams. But again, I have to say that I think this kalam of Amir Khusro, which we're going to look at today, this poet, this poem, um, I think it has to be the poem uh, in terms of where I have seen ulama, true scholars, uh, you know, in a state of of, uh, of of I don't know what spiritual state they were in, losing themselves in the love of the Prophet وسلم, listening to this poem. Why? Why does it have that appeal and that effect? And I said to you, I would disclose a couple of things to you, which in my knowledge perhaps is the reason why this affects people in such a way. One is the story behind it, but there's another reason as well. And that reason, one day his sheikh was so pleased with him, he said to him, 
Khusra, what would you, what do you want? Ask me. Ask me whatever you, t what, what would you like? What can I give to you as a gift? And so, Khaja Amir Khusro, he said to his sheikh, he said, I would like for you to gift me power in my words. Affect the power and ability for my words to affect others. To have an effect, uh, to affect others or to have an effect on others. And so, Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said to him, uh, go and get some... Uh, Go and get some shakkar, which is uh, uh, something formulated from raw sort of uh, sugar cane uh, extract, uh, sweetener. He said, go and get some shakkar and eat a small amount yourself and distribute the rest along the floor. And he did that and Amir Khusra himself says that from that day, my words became mesmerizing to anyone who listened. And so that's one thing. That Amir Khusro has the dua of his Sheikh Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya, Rahimallah Ta'ala. And he's the fountain, he's the point why uh, the Chishti, why one strand of the modern strand of the Chishti Silsla is known as Chishti Nizami. Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya, Rahimallah Ta'ala. When you have dua of Khaja Nizamuddin Mahbub Ilahi, then your poetry will affect people. That's one reason. Another reason is. Uh, he, regarding his own personal character, he was uh, a very, a very extremely pious individual. Spent a lot of his time in worship. And it wasn't just like, you know, Amir Khosro, you, you, you might be developing this image in your mind of somebody who's sitting in royal courts uh, around the kings and so on, and then, you know, from time to time visiting his sheikh. No. He lived for his sheikh. He lived for his sheikh. You see this in the yearning uh, in his poetry. But beyond that, he lived to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amir Khusro was someone whose, whose even his tahajjud would never be qaza. And this is known, it's on record. This is why I was saying to you, if, you, you know, if, if you're looking for a hippie style culture, then that's not the sawaf and you come to the wrong place. Because these are people who have dedicated themselves to, their, uh, to, to serving their shuyukh, to serving the deen through them and to serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beloved. So he would never even miss his tahajjud. And one day his sheikh, he asked him, he said, Khusra, what are your, what are your engagements? What do you do all day? Or what do you, what do, you do in the morning? And Khadja Amir Khusra, he says that he, his, his response to sheikh, his sheikh, Khadja Nizamuddin Awliya, his response was that I wake up for tahajjud. I pray tahajjud. And after tahajjud, I recite seven chapters of the Qur'an. I recite seven parahs, seven chapters of, that, uh, of the Qur'an and daily. And by then, I'm in tears and I'm, I'm in a state. And that was his answer. I, I, I start reciting the Qur'an, I get through seven chapters and by then I'm in, a, I'm in floods of tears and I'm in a state. He was so beloved to his sheikh, this love was mutual. Well, he wasn't just in living for his sheikh. His sheikh, well, he was also very dear to his sheikh as well. To the extent that his sheikh said to him that, uh, you know, if only we could be buried in the same grave. If only we could share the same grave. But he said that the Sharia will not allow this and this, this won't happen. However, Khusra, I'm telling you that our graves will be located next to each other. This is something that he foretold in his lifetime. And that's how it is today. If you go to Delhi and visit the Mazar of Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya, Rahmanullah Ta'ala, you will find at his feet the Mazar of Khaja Amir Khusra, Rahmanullah Ta'ala. So it's a love that transcends the borders of, uh, of this physical life. And you know, not just that something quite amazing for a sheikh to say for his murid. You know, the, the, the murid, uh, and especially uh, today, um, I, I don't even want, want to go down that line in terms of what, uh, what can happen when we listen to the murid talking about the sheikh. But uh, the sheikh talking about the murid, he says, Khusra, if somebody was to take a saw 
and cut my body in half. And said to me, he threatened, he put uh, a saw on my head and threatened me, said, leave the Turk, Turk, right? Because remember, Amir Khusro, his origins were uh, from Turkey. So, Qadir Nizamuddin Awliya, ta'ala, he said, if somebody was to place a saw on my head and say to me, leave the Turk, I would happily have my body cut into two pieces, but I would not leave you. I will not distance myself from you. And so, this kind of attachment, we've seen this. I'll give you two very brief examples. Shah Ali Rasul Mar Haravi, Rahimallah Ta'ala, he's the sheikh of Allah Hazrat Imam Muhammad Raza, Rahimallah Ta'ala. You know what he said about Imam Muhammad Raza? He says, on the day of judgment, if Allah is going to ask me, Ali Rasul, what did you do in the dunya? What, is your, what, are, what are your earnings from the dunya? What have, you, what have you done? What have you accomplished? I will present Ahmad Raza and I will say, this is my accomplishment in the dunya. The same thing was said by my grand sheikh, Huzur Shaykh al-Islam wal-Muslimin Khadi Akamruddin Siyalwi rahimahullah ta'ala about Peer Muhammad Karam Shah sahab rahmatullahi wa He was so proud of him, he said that if Allah asked me on the day of judgment, what have you done in this dunya, I will present Karam Shah and I will say this is my, this is what I've earned in the dunya. So this attachment and this bond, you, you have to be very, very special to earn that kind of an attachment with the Shaykh. It tells you, it, it speaks volumes about who Amir Khusra was. There's two different narrations. Um, I'm going into the background of this poem now. And before I do so, I think it's, uh, I'll, I'll stop there for a moment. And uh, you, we can hand out these, uh, these notes. It's a, it's, a, it's a poem in the original Persian language with the English transliteration and also a uh, translation as well. Obviously with poetry, you never really get a proper translation, but uh, no, you can't transfer that, those sentiments within the poetry, but it is uh, it's a translation of the, of the words. So you can pass these around. Uh, we'll be coming to this shortly. Before I go into that background, <clears throat> just to tell you that uh, one of the reasons why I, I chose this particular sequence and this order, we are in the Islamic month of Shawwal, and 17th of Shawwal is the Urs of Amir Khusro Rahmanullah Khan. So last week when I was intending to do one session, that would have tied in very, very closely with his, with the date of his urs and his passing away. But he was still in this month. So it's a very uh, apt a tribute to uh, Amir Khusro, uh, Rahimallah Ta'ala, that we're doing this in the month of uh, Shawwal. So he passed away on the 17th of Shawwal, finding a place for his grave uh, at the feet of his sheikh. Um, On one occasion, uh, Amir Khusro, Rahimallah Ta'ala, he went to see Ali Ahmad Sabir Kanjari, Rahimallah Ta'ala, uh, who is the nephew of Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya, Rahmatullah Ta'ala, his sheikh. Right? So his own sheikhs, uh, so his grand sheikh is his nephew. That's a connection between the two. When he came, back to see his sheikh, Khadr Nizamuddin Awliya, because he'd gone to see uh, someone who was related to his sheikh, when Amir Khusro came into the gathering, or he came into the dargah, Khadr Nizamuddin Awliya, rahimahullah ta'ala, he stood up. This is something uh, to take on board in terms of, you know, etiquettes of, uh, you know, etiquettes of the ulama, respect of, you know, the ulama and the shuyukh and so on. And also, remember Sayyidina Ali, Ali al-Murtadha radiallahu ta'ala, all his, <coughs> all his words about, you know, that anyone who's taught me even one word. And, and, and how, you know, to, to the extent that he's even attributed to have said that, um, I, you know, 
I am then uh, his servant and he can do with me as he pleases. For teaching one word. So something to particularly remember, Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya Rahmanullah when he, because he'd gone to his Sheikh's uh, nephew, when Amir Khusro came in, Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya Rahmanullah he stood up. He stood up and he embraced him. And he said, give me your hands. And he kissed his hands. He said, I want to kiss those hands that have shook hands with my Sheikh's nephew. And he, uh, he went close to him and he kissed his eyes. I said, he said, you have seen my friend with these eyes. So this is the kind of love and respect that we've seen from them. Huzur Shaykh al-Islam, again, my Grand Shaykh Khadiyah Kamruddin Salvi, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala. My father uh, used to tell us this story. I witnessed himself having traveled with the Shaykh to Tonsa Sharif, which is where uh, uh, Khadiyah Kamruddin Salvi, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, and Sial Sharif gets there in terms of the, the chain. Tonsa Sharif is above Sial Sharif. Right? So the, that's the, the fares comes from there. In that, that <coughs> and my father... Uh, an eyewitness account would tell us that as soon as we arrived at the boundary of Tonsa Sharif, Shaykh al-Islam, the person who was unanimously in the entire, not like today, who at that time unanimously in the entire Muslim Sunni world was the only, the only individual who was known by and given the title by the greatest ulama of the time of Shaykh al-Islam. That's how great he was, a, that's how great a scholar he was. Shaykh al-Islam of that time walked into the, the city or the village of his Shaykh when he got to the boundary he took his shoes off, his sandals off and he walked barefooted to the Dargah. Right? So this, this poem, how does it come about? Um, and this is where you see you know, that thing about the effect that it has again. This is where you'll see the second thing. One was that he has the dua of his sheikh. The other thing is there's a story behind this. As the story goes, his sheikh, Khadja Nizamuddin Awliya, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, he said to Amir Khusro, he said, go and visit a particular sheikh who was residing in Delhi at the same time, who was around at the same time, who's known as Bu Ali Shah Qalandar, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala. He said, go, go, go and see him and sit in his gatherings. In one narration, it's mentioned that the king actually sent a gift at the, you know, through the hands of Amir Khusro to Sheikh Bwali Shah Kalandar Rahmanullah Ta'ala. The other narration says that it was his Sheikh Khadja Nizamuddin Awliya who sent him. Anyhow, he went to his gathering and he started to go there every Thursday or frequently until eventually Shaykh Bwali Shah Kalandar, Rahmanullah Ta'ala, he said to Amir Khusro, he said, I have visited the court of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but I've never seen your Shaykh Nizamuddin Awliya then. <coughs> What's going on? And this sort of, it put something in Khusro's heart. He, he was really, you know, he, it disappointed him, if that's, you know, for, for lack of a better word, it, he felt really uh, disappointed or you know, he couldn't believe it that his sheikh uh, and a, a contemporary of Bu Ali Shah Kalandar <coughs> and he's saying that I've been to the court and kajari of the Prophet وسلم, but I've never seen your sheikh there. Does that mean that my sheikh doesn't have that status? And he started thinking about this and thinking about this and so on. <coughs> Until eventually, you know, it could really be seen in his manner that, you know, that, that he was upset about something. And he was, uh, the reason why perhaps that Bwali Shah Kalandar had told him that maybe he would go back to Nizamuddin Awliya, Rahimullah Ta'ala, and either he would disclose to him or he would send him back to him and tell him to disclose the matter. You will ultimately, you will find out that the reason why he said this was to highlight in front of Khusro the status that Nizamuddin Awliya actually had. When he saw this, when he realized that he's now, he's, he's, this thing is eating him up inside, one day 
Well, Ishaq Kalandar Rahmanatala, he asked him again. He said, Khusro, didn't you ask your Shaykh about, what did I tell you? I told you to ask your Shaykh why he is never there. Didn't you ask him? And he said, no. Why don't you just tell me? At that point, Wadi Shah Kalandar Rahmanatala, he placed his hand on Amir Khusro's chest, on his heart. And he said, close your eyes. Khusro closed his eyes, the eyes of his, his body, his head were closed and the eyes of his heart were opened. And he peered into his heart, into that mirror. <coughs> and what, is, what did he see? Amir Khusra explains, he says, I, I saw that I am now present in the court of Rasulullah His Sahaba and the awliya, the great awliya, they are sitting around the Prophet And I stood there looking, <coughs> looking at each face, going around looking at each face. And my Sheikh Nilamuddin Awliya, he wasn't there. And so then he says, uh, the Prophet وسلم, asked me, he said, Khusro, what are you looking for? Who are you looking for? And I said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm looking for my Sheikh, Khalil Nizamuddin Awliya. He said, Khusro, go to the next, uh, go to the next court up. Go to the second court, the higher court. And so he went there. And the same thing happened and the Prophet Islam asked him, Khusro, who are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for Mahbub Allahi, Nizamuddin Awliya. He said, go to the third one. And he went through all, he went through seven of the courts of the Prophet Wasallam. At the seventh one, again the same thing happened. He looked around and then he really became really upset in that. He's nowhere to be seen, all seven of them, and he's nowhere to be seen in any of them. And again, the Prophet ﷺ asked him, he said, Khusro, who are you looking for? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm looking for Nizamuddin Awliya. And the Prophet ﷺ, and this is the last one, this is the seventh court, where do I go now? The, the seventh heaven, if you like, was guys, the seventh court, where do I go now? And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Khusro, there's something beyond this as well. There's something above this as well. Go there. <coughs> And when he went there, what did he find? He, uh, in fact, in that seventh court, right, he was sitting there, uh, he's standing there, and the Prophet is asking him, who are you looking for? And he says, Nizamuddin Awliya. And the Prophet points to somebody who's sitting in front of the Prophet with uh, his head covered with a shawl, as our honorable guest Malana is, uh, is sitting. <laughs> and... Uh, not showing his face and when Khusro arrives there he removes the shawl and there's Nizamuddin Awliya sitting at right at the very highest level exactly opposite Rasulullah and as he's looking at this in all of a sudden the hand comes off and it's all gone the hand comes off the, sh off the chest and the heart and it's, and it's gone and Buhari Kalandar Shah, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, and he says to him, Khusro, now do you see where your Shaykh was? Do you, do you understand the maqam and the status of your Shaykh? And this is why I wasn't to upset you. The reason why I said this was for you to know what the status of your Shaykh actually is. And so, what did he actually see there? Have a look at the poem. Nami danam che manzil bood, shab jaye ke man boodam. I wonder what that place was where I was last night. Baharsu rakse bismil bud shab jaye ke man Everywhere, all around me, were people. And I remember, uh, I told you last time as well. Bismil uh, is uh, the, uh, the the bird that's being slaughtered. Once you slaughter a bird, it doesn't just sort of uh, become lifeless all of a sudden. It will flap around and it will be in a complete frenzy and panic even after the, the, the throat has been cut. And he says, I found people who were in that kind of frenzy and panic, victims of love, tossing in agony the place where I was last night. He was like an angel, a fairy, an angel, Pari. Pekar means the, the body, physical beauty. Pari Pekar Nigare, 
سرو قد ان اردو و پنجابی وہ انڈرسٹینڈ سرو right a very tall tree cypress and he say in height lala rukh sare like a tulip in terms of the facial expression this was the beloved sarapa afate dil bood shab jaye ke man boodam an embodiment of a test for the hearts of the lovers and afat literally means if i was to translate this very literally it would be uh you know this was a calamity for the lovers but not not the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam not describing anybody else here or someone's physical beauty so the embodiment of a test of the hearts of the lovers the place where i was last night raqiba gosh bar awaz u dar naz man tarsa says that uh the enemies were ready to respond and he was attracting you know in that his beauty was such that everyone was drawn to him mantarsa and i was not really dreading i think that's uh, I, i would change that to uh, uh, yearning and longing sukhan guftan je mushkil bood is such a place that it was it was so difficult to speak out there shab jaye ke man bood in the place where i was last night Now that one just a little bit of explanation to to that in that you know it, when you love somebody the love of the dunya doesn't allow someone else to share that love with you but the love of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is such that it is a bond that is shared by billions and it makes them stronger and it brings them closer together hmm? so um خدا خود نیرے مجلس بود اندر لا مکان خسو what he saw we don't know i mean this is how he expresses now he says that allah was presiding over that gathering himself in la maka no, no place no time because allah uh, is free from place and time muhammad shamm mahfil bud muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the light of that gathering shab jaye ke man bud where i was last night and so this is a direct explanation of when puri kalandar shah rahmatullah taala lay put his hand on khusro's heart on his chest told him to close his eyes and look at his his mirror or looking glass and what he saw he's one of the very few sufiya this is something that perhaps they would keep private to themselves what they see when they in the state of barakaba they're looking down he's the, he's one of those who's disclosed to us what he actually saw and those who understand from it the ulama in particular i'm talking about who understand the background who understand the relationship between abir khusro and khaja nizamuddin awliya who understand all of this and then added to that the dua of nizamuddin awliya is what i personally believe is what allows this kalam this poem to have such an immense effect on those who listen to this poem that i've never seen uh, perhaps anyone as strongly affected by a kalam as i've seen people uh, affected by this who listen to this and so we'll conclude with that we'll conclude with the recitation i'll recite these few verses for you and we will conclude with that inshallah namida nam che manzil bood shab jaye ke man boodam نمیدانم چے منزل بود شب جائے کے من بودم بہر سورت سے بسمل بود شب جائے کے من بودم بہر سورت سے بسمل بود شب جائے کے من بودم پری پہ کر نگار سرو قد لال رخ سارے سرا پا دل بود 
शब जाए के मन बूदम सरापा आफते दिल बूद शब जाए के मन बूदम रकीबा को सुखन गो तंचे मुश्किल बूद शब जाए के मन बूदम सुखन गो तंचे मुश्किल बूद शब जाए के मन बूदम खुदा खुद मीरे मजिल बूद खुदा खुद मीरे मजिल बूद अंदर लाम का खुशरो खुदा खुद मीरे मजिल बूद अंदर लाम का खुशरो मोहम्मद शम महफिल बूद शब जाए के मन बूदम मोहम्मद शम महफिल बूद शब जाए के मन बूदम नमीदा नमचे मंजिल बूद शब जाए के मन बूदम बहर सूर से बिस्मिल बूद शब जाए के मन बूदम जस्ट बिफोर वी कंक्लूड एन अनाउंसमेंट इंशाल्लाह संडे Apologies for going slightly over. We did start with a delay because of namaz, but uh, on Sunday, inshallah, Asr till Maghrib. So half past seven is Asr. Uh, Maghrib is just after nine o'clock. We'll, we've got a program commemorating the life of Sayyidina uh, Sayyidu Shahada Sayyidina Hamza, radhiyallahu anhu, the beloved uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And if that's all you know about Sayyidina Hamza, radhiyallahu anhu, and that he was the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then I would strongly encourage and advise you to attend that gathering. <coughs> Um, he's a mo most remarkable character in Islamic history. Um, so Sunday, Asr uh, till Maghrib, and sisters will be downstairs here, brothers upstairs in the masjid. Uh, please do make an effort to attend and pass that message on to others as well. Um, I'm going to ask you to recite Al-Fatiha, and I'm going to ask our honourable guest, uh, Sheikh uh, Usman Ali Dar, um, to conclude with du'a, in particular, Isal Iswal for Qadir Ali Khusro. Rahim Allah Taala, whose uh, whose life we've just looked at, his kalam we've recited, and this is the month of his uh, Rasul of his passing away. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وصل عليه اللهم أنت السلام منك السلام وإليك يرجع السلام حينا ربنا بالسلام وأدخلنا دار السلام تبارك ربنا وتعالي تيات الجلال والإكرام ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وأدخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار يا رب العالمين اللهم يا شافي الأمراض اشف مرضانا اللهم يا شافي الأمراض اشف مرضانا اللهم يا شافي الأمراض اشف مرضانا اللهم يا قاضي الحاجات فقط حاجاتنا اللهم يا حل المشكلات حل المشكلاتنا اللهم يا خير الناصرين انصرنا اللهم يا خير الرازقين ارزقنا رزقا حلالا طيبا ومباركا فيه 
اللهم أجرنا من النار اللهم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر إخواننا في فلسطين وإخواننا في الشام وإخواننا في العراق وإخواننا في كل مكان اللهم أجرنا من النار اللهم أجرنا من النار اللهم أجرنا من النار والله سبحانه وتعالى we ask you to accept our gathering ya Allah والله سبحانه وتعالى we ask you to allow us to leave this gathering sinless ya Allah والله سبحانه وتعالى we ask you to bless us in our this world and in the hereafter ya Allah والله سبحانه وتعالى we ask you to send the reward of this gathering ya Allah to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a gift and to all the anbiya which came before ya Allah والله سبحانه وتعالى we ask you to send this reward to all the sahaba the tabi'een, taba tabi'een, ulama, shuhada, salihin, ya Allah. And we ask you to send this reward to Amir Khusra, rahmatullahi ta'ala, alayhi, ya Allah. And to all the awliya ikram who mentioned here today, ya Allah. O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, send this reward to all our ancestors who died upon iman, ya Allah. O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, raise their rankings in Jannat al-Firdaus al-A'la, ya Allah. O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, allow us to gather with these awliya Allah in Jannat al-Firdaus al-A'la, ya Allah. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, allow us to drink from the fountain of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bless our states, ya Allah. O oh Allah, make our difficulties easy, ya Allah. O oh Allah, those amongst us who are ill, O oh Allah, cure us from our illnesses, ya Allah. O oh Allah, cure us from our physical and our spiritual ailments, ya Allah. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, increase us in knowledge, ya Allah. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, allow us to act upon the knowledge that we have, ya Allah. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have no one else to turn to except you, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, have mercy upon us, Ya Allah. Have mercy upon the Muslims all over the world, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, unite us and don't divide us, Ya Allah. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, allow us to increase ourselves in knowledge and act on what we learn, Ya Allah. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to raise the rankings of Amir Khusr, rahmatullahi ta'ala, alayhi, Ya Allah. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ithar al-sawab of the samadlis, ya Allah, we ask you to allow this to be a means for the purification of our hearts, ya Allah. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayri khalkihi wa nuri arshihi muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Amin wa rahmatika ya arham al-rahim. Very quickly, if anyone's got any questions at all. Zakla, thank you for attending. Apologies once again for this slight delay. Inshallah, we'll be... I will endeavour to keep the uh, timing script uh, henceforth, inshallah. Uh, next week, Maulana Abdul Rahman Jami, uh, one of the most intense uh, stories of love you will ever come across, inshallah.